It was when he tried to talk about the boat that Joe's words began to falter and tears welled up in his bright eyes. At first I thought he meant the husky quipper, the racing shell in which he had rowed his way to glory. Or did he mean his teammates, the improbable assemblage of young men who had pulled off one of rowing's greatest achievements? Finally, watching Joe struggle for composure over and over, I realized that the boat was something more than just the shell or its crew. To Joe, it encompassed but transcended both. It was something mysterious and almost beyond definition. It was a shared experience, a singular thing that had unfolded in a golden sliver of time long gone when nine good-hearted young men strove together, pulled together as one, gave everything they had for one another, bound together forever by pride and respect and love. Joe was crying, at least in part, for the loss of that vanished moment, but much more, I think, for the sheer beauty of it. Great Britain leading on the far side, Italy coming up, Germany nearly to us third, Hungary fourth. There's America, away over there. Just in front to win by a yard. Italy second, Germany third. Welcome. My name is Paul Hansen. I'm with Village Books. I'm here interviewing Daniel James Brown, author of Boys in the Boat, on behalf of Western Reads. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. Well, oh, thanks for being here. The, uh, so you've done a lot of these Western, or the, a lot of these community reads. Have you kind of lost track how many? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been on the road a lot lately uh, doing community reads. I just came back from Missouri where they had mm. uh, a very nice program. It's been, I've been astonished at uh, how elaborate some of these community read programs are, including the one here at Western. Uh, they're really innovative, interesting mm. topics that people are talking about related to the book. So it's fun to, it's fun to come in and be part of that. Yeah, it really helps having a, a book that has so many doorways into it, doorways of interest. I, I think this book does have some, uh, quite a few doorways. There's, there's obviously the, hits, the history both here in the United States during the Depression and also what was happening in Germany uh, during the rise of the Nazis. So there's a lot of history that you can uh, leverage off of. And then, of course, the psychology of what was going on with Joe Rance and his family and the boat building. And there's just a lots of, it was partly what was fun about writing the book was finding all these different elements or angles to the story. So yeah. I think that fits. It's natural that uh, the Northwest communities would be drawn to it, but they're drawn to it in the Midwest as well. You know, I was not long ago in Wichita, Kansas, and I arrived late because I had a misconnection on my flight, and I was not at all sure people would be there at all, and I arrived an hour and a half late at this bookstore in Wichita, and the place was packed. Um, so it turns out people are interested in this topic. You know, it turns out the book is about so much more than rowing. The, the initial audience for the book was rowers, but there's so many other things going on in the book that uh, at this point it seems to have found its audience in a much broader stage. Yeah. So how did you find this book? What initially drew you to this topic? Right, this story is a writer's <laughs> dream. This story literally walked into <coughs> my life one day uh, about six years ago. Uh, we were having a homeowners association meeting in my home and um, one of my neighbors, a lady I knew only as Judy, came to me and she said that she'd been reading one of my earlier books to her father. And her, her dad was um, in the last couple of months of his life living under hospice care at her home. And uh, she was reading this earlier book to him and he was enjoying that. And uh, she wondered if I'd come down to, uh, to meet him. So I think it was the next day I went down and I met this elderly, elderly gentleman named Joe Rance. And uh, Joe just poured out this gorgeous story about his own experiences growing up during the Depression and then um, how he had begun to row on the crew at the University of Washington starting in 1933 and how ultimately he and his crewmates had, uh, had wound up rowing against a German boat, amongst others, in front of Hitler at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And, um, you know, it was just 
it, it was just a wonderful story from the moment I heard it, and I spent the next four years just trying to do justice, basically, to that story. Right. So you did have a couple of months to spend with Joe. Yeah, Joe lived for a couple of months after I first met him, mm -hmm. and uh, he was elderly and getting quite weak, so I didn't want to push it too much, but I had a number of conversations with him. Mm -hmm. And then what really saved the day uh, in terms of developing Joe's part of the book after he passed away was that um, his daughter Judy had spent the last five years of Joe's life following him around with a, literally with a pad of paper and a pencil in her hand, prompting him for the smallest kinds of details about uh, his experiences growing up during the Depression, his years rowing on the crew, and uh, the, the 36 Berlin Olympic experience. So even after Joe passed away, we had an extraordinary amount of material to work with in terms of developing his, his part of the story. Right. I've uh, often tried to get that kind of information from my father, but I'm sure there's a, a way to ask those questions that drills down to the specifics rather than, tell me about the Depression. Yeah, exactly. Judy was very persistent and, uh, and got a great deal of detail. You know, when I met Joe, when I sat down with Joe in the couple months I did have with him, I found often I would ask a question that was not very productive. But Judy, because she knew the story so well, was sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. She often was able to follow up with a question that actually turned out to be much more productive because right. she had spent so much time talking to her dad about this in advance. Right. Were there uh, other members of the crew that were alive at the time? At the time, there was only one other uh, of the fellows still alive, Roger Morris, who was the bow man in the boat. Okay was still alive, and I talked to him. Um, he lived for about a year after I started. Um, and so I got a, quite a bit of good information also from, from Roger. But, you know, within a year, both of them were gone. And mm -hmm. so part of what was very fortunate for me as a writer is that um, once the family members of the other fellows in the boat found out what I was doing, these families have been sitting on this story for 75 years just hoping somebody would tell it. Uh -huh. And so the family members of, the, of everybody in the boat started coming to me with letters and diaries and boxes of old photos. And they sat down with me for many, many hours of interviews. Mm. And so I was, over the course of several years, I was able to get to know each of the, each of the guys in the boat um, pretty well through children and grandchildren. Right. But Joe remains the, the central character. Joe, for you. Yeah, Joe remains the central character of the book. You know. Yeah. They all had great backstories. They were all great kids. They were always very interesting. But Joe's personal story was particularly compelling. He had this uh, this very difficult family situation to overcome during the Depression, and and that really is at the heart of the of the underlying story. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the uh, when you're doing research to get access to it through the families is a, a challenge and something you have to wrestle with. It was great you didn't have to do that. You know, these families were were very eager to to have the story told and. Uh, so, so they had a lot of picnics. I understood they got together often and, and shared stories. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, one of the things I was thinking about as I was uh, realizing your research about this is, and I was just visiting my own family back in the Midwest, and we were sharing stories and realized we all had different perceptions of the same kind of events right. and uh, wondered how different this, or either how much the stories might have evolved over the years with the telling. Yeah or how much perception might you, change? You, you can never know how much a story has evolved. When you only have one source, of course, you can't be sure how much it has evolved in the mm -hmm. telling. Although, I was able, in this case, there was so much coverage of this cruise exploits in the 1930s that for most of the factual material, you know, how fast was a particular race or, or mm -hmm. what was the circumstance of, of this event or that, I was actually able to verify a lot of the sort of accounts that I heard, the anecdotal stuff I heard from family, I was able to dig into the archives and actually um, validate um, a great deal of what was just told to me anecdotally. But it's true, it's an event that happened at the time 75 years before, and so you are relying on, on memories that are pretty old, and you just, you do your best to try to double check and get, uh, get another view of the same topic when, when, and, when and where you can. So that makes me think also of the, um, uh, like in a movie, there's a distillation of the themes because they can't include everything. Yeah. And uh, in a book, you have to do the same thing. You had to pick and choose the, the themes you were going to include. Yeah, I mean, certain themes sort of evolved organically out of this story. It became very evident early on, for instance, that part of this story was about class um, and part of it was about region. These boys 
in the boat were all working class kids. They're kids that grew up on dairy farms and in mill towns around western Washington. Um, but to get where they wanted to go, they had to go up against and defeat kids from Ivy League schools, kids who were the sons of titans of industry or U.S. senators in some cases. And then they had to go on and row against kids from Oxford and Cambridge in the U.K., kids who were, in some cases, aristocrats. And then they had to go on and row against this elite Nazi crew. So there was always this sort of class uh, theme at work. Uh, these were ordinary working class Americans. There was also pretty early on, obviously, an East Coast versus West Coast sort of theme that was uh, interesting to explore. It was just one of many examples in the 1930s of this sort of regional tension in yeah. the country. So, you know, various themes evolved as the book developed. Um, but I'm sure there's still not a, an East-West tension going on. Actually, I was just talking to some rowers this morning, and apparently there still is something of that at work. <laughs> so. And I know that in the publishing world there is definitely yeah, uh, something. Yeah. I was just going to say it doesn't limit itself just to the, the no, rowing world. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about George Pocock. George Pocock. He's, uh, you, you've got the, the quotes at the, the beginning there, and his, uh, his spirit really runs through this. And yeah. I think a lot of people agree that that's, that's one of the parts that really resonates with people. Yeah. Um, it was actually, give, should give credit, it was Judy, Joe's daughter, who, who came up with the idea of putting a little quote from Pocock at the beginning of every mm -hmm. chapter. For that very reason, we wanted the spirit of Pocock to permeate the whole book. Pocock was this. Um, fascinating British-born boat builder who wound up handcrafting these lovely cedar shells mm -hmm. for the University of Washington and by the mid-1930s for everybody, every rowing program in the country. And there's one hanging here in the Viking Union. There is one hanging right, right here on this campus, yeah. yes, and there are quite a few hanging in, in various places these days as artifacts. They're such beautiful things to look at themselves. Mm -hmm. But the thing about Pocock is he was um, he was a consummate craftsman. He believed, he said once, that every time he built a shell, he, he wanted to leave a part of his own heart in that shell. He wanted to give everything he could to his craft. He was also a very good rower, and he taught these boys from Washington to approach rowing the same way that he approached building a shell, to approach it as a craft. And he told them that they should leave a part of their heart in every race that they rowed. Mm. And for Pocock, there was even a spiritual side to rowing. He saw rowing as something by which young men could elevate themselves, um, raise themselves beyond their ordinary, uh, everyday concerns, become part of something larger, mm -hmm. and even come in contact with, uh, with the divine. He talked at times about how rowing was a path to come in contact with the divine. Mm -hmm. So he was a fascinating man. and. Uh, and he may really made a difference for not just these nine young men, but actually generations of, in those days it was all men who rode for the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. So he had a, uh, a, a, he was a quiet man. He had a quiet effect upon the team. Uh, not a reticent kind of quiet like the coach. Yes. Uh, and the two of them had a, a real strong relationship in, in the, uh, the coaching techniques. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, this, this crew was formed by these two very different men. Pocock was this very gentle, very quiet, but very wise man. Al Ulbrichsen, who was technically their coach, who was their coach, mm -hmm. was a very reticent man, uh, but a very, a very um, firm uh, man, a very hard man in some ways, very demanding, very tough. And so these boys were shaped in some ways by this sort of yin and yang between these two different kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. And somehow that all worked for them. You know, it, it turned them into tr truly outstanding uh, oarsmen. And, and more than that, a truly outstanding team because that's really what this book is all about. It's, how, it's about how these young men became together part of something larger than themselves, this, mm -hmm. this crew. And so this strange dynamic between Pocock and Ulbrichs and the coach was very much at play in that. Mm -hmm. And watching the team uh, develop over the years and uh, playing with those different dynamics and trying to put in different people into the boat. Was yeah. Part of, part of Ulbrichs's uh, real contribution, the coach's contribution to this, was he, there's a kind of alchemy to putting great crews together. Uh, Bob Ernst, who is now the director of rowing at Washington, told me once he would never take the strong, the eight strongest men or eight strongest women that he had and put them in a shell. Mm -hmm. uh, or or would, rather, he would never take 
the strongest man or the strongest woman clone that man or woman and then put those eight clones in a shell. A crew is much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. It has to be more diverse than that. You have to have different kinds of personalities and different kinds of body types and different kinds of abilities to make a crew really work. Ulbrichsen was very good at this sort of alchemy of mixing and matching the, the, the boys, in this case, in order to get just the right mix that would produce a boat that would outstrip any other boat. Mm -hmm. How much of the, um, that makes me, uh, with, uh, with Joe and his journey, uh, when they pulled him out of the boat, all of a sudden it just didn't work, but yet, to, and a large, or many times he seemed like the weakest link, he was inconsistent. Yep. And uh, how much of that was Joe's realization or your realization as you were going through the writing? You know, it came, it, Joe, it's, uh, Joe came to a point in his life where he, he knew he wasn't um, fitting in with the other guys in the boat and he talked to Pocock. It was actually Pocock that told him that he had to learn to trust the other guys in the boat. And it's absolutely true. He, was, he didn't realize his full potential as an oarsman. Uh, for the first couple years he was at Washington, it, Sometimes he would row very well. Other times he would try to row the boat across the line all by himself, which just isn't the way a crew works. Mm -hmm. He had this conversation with Pocock that sort of centered him and made him understand that he had to fit into this larger thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a actually very interesting. The, the log books of Coach Ulbrichsen are in the special collections at UW. Mm. And so I went and I looked at um, his log books. And they're largely just recordings of the times that each boat turned in. There came a day in the spring of 1936 when Albrechtson finally put Joe Rance in the boat. He was sort of cultivating this one boat as the boat he was hoping would go to the Olympics, but it wasn't really turning in the kinds of times he wanted. There came a day when he put Joe Rance in the number seven seat, and you can see in the logbook the times just jump, jump enormously. That boat just took off. And the next day it went out and it went even faster, and the next day it went even faster. And that was because Joe already knew a lot of the boys who were in that boat and had already built relationships with them. And so he was really comfortable in that boat. And when, when he, he was the final piece, basically, that, that made that boat into the Olympic boat. When Albrechtson wow. put him in there, he, he had the boat he was going to go all the way with. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting to see those log books. Wow, wow. Bobby Mock is another important part. As in any boat. Yeah, the coxswain, Bobby Mock the coxswain, is a real character, as coxswains often are. Mm -hmm. you know, coxswains have this... And you didn't like him at first. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, well, Bob was a, uh, a very strong personality, and um, that's another thing coxswains tend to have to be. Mm -hmm. You know, this relatively small person, nowadays it's often a woman in a men's boat, um, this relatively small person has to step into a boat and exert control over and authority over a boatload of very large people, mm -hmm. which is part of what's so interesting about coxswains. Bob Mock was a consummate coxswain. He was very smart. He was very assertive. He was very vocal. He was um, good with psychology. He knew how to get a lot out of the, the guys in the boat with him. And so he's one of my favorite characters in, in the book, actually, mm -hmm. perhaps because I'm coxswain size myself. <laughs> I can identify with that. Um, and he just turns out to be, in many of these races, he turns out to be the deciding factor, the reason they won the race in several very important races, because Mock was thinking things through as the race was evolving. And in the last one, he's lying to them. <laughs> and, he, and, and, all, and more than once, actually lying to them about where they are in the field mm -hmm. in order to keep them motivated. Right. Yeah. Huh. So there's a, some of my favorite history teachers growing up were the ones who could bring history to life through individual stories and the, the details beyond the, the facts and the figures. That's definitely something that you do with the boys in the boat, which makes it so accessible to so many people because it reads like a novel, but it's with real people. Right. Well, this is, yeah, I mean, this is what I'm trying to do, of course, in a book like this. I, I read mostly narrative nonfiction. This is a genre that I write, but it's also a genre I read a lot of. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in the case of this particular book, actually, I had a specific model in mind. The day after I met Joe Rance, I got a copy of Seabiscuit, which is Laura Hillenbrand's first book. And I sat down with it over the next couple of weeks, and I annotated every page in it, just studying the writing decisions that mm -hmm. she had made, because I think she's so very good at this, at this genre. You know, at, at taking 
what could be a dry piece of history and infusing it with the personalities and the drama that were really at work there. Yeah. So I, I learned a lot from studying her, and, uh, and that's very much the kind of thing I enjoy doing. They come from, yeah, well, they go from real life to characters that you come to know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit with uh, the research part of things. So that's the, the narrative craft, but in the research, at what point does, um, obviously you have to do a lot of research to, before you get the groundwork for your storytelling. Yeah. At what point does the research start and you know you're ready to start telling the story? Well, I basically take sort of two cuts at it. After I met Joe, for instance, with this book, I spent the next six to nine months, I think, basically just researching every aspect of the story and just creating a simple timeline. This happened on this day in 1934 in Seattle. This happened in Germany on this day in 1935 because I knew from the beginning there was going to be a strand involving what was happening in Germany uh, simultaneously. So I just spent a number of months just creating a simple timeline to get the overall sense of what was going to be in the story and sort of the arc of the story big cut of research. The way I work then is I go back and I start with the first scene. In this case, the first scene is Joe and Roger Morris. They had told, both of them told me about the first day they met and walked down to the Shell House. So mm -hmm. I took that as the first scene and I researched the heck out of it. I got some photographs that happened to be taken on the campus that day and it showed clusters of students sitting around in uh, circles on the lawn mm -hmm. wearing certain kind of clothes. The women and the men were those smoking. A lot of them were reading newspapers. So I went and got the newspapers for that day and uh, the Seattle Times and the PI and the Washington Daily and I read those papers from cover to cover to find out what were those kids talking about sitting in those circles mm -hmm. as Joe and Roger walked past. I got the weather for that day. So what I do is when I... You know, that's so excellent. I'm glad you said that because people have said because you have so many specific details. Say, oh, how could you know yeah, It that? becomes incredible, exactly. Yeah. Um, the but reality is... <laughs> to I never doubted. It. It <laughs> <laughs> well, many people do. But mm -hmm. I love that kind of granular... Uh, research, you know, I like, that's the only way you're going to bring that scene to life is yeah. to find those very specific details that may seem as if you're simply making them up. They're there if you look hard enough for mm -hmm. them. And so the way I work is I, I research a scene like that until I know every aspect of what I want it to be. And actually I was telling some students earlier today, it's, I'm kind of a fear-driven writer. I, I get that scene in my mind and I'm thinking about it and I've done all this research and I'm doing more research to get more details and I get to a point where I suddenly realize I've got to write this down or I'm going to lose it. So whether I'm mowing the lawn or taking a shower or whatever I'm doing, I drop everything, I run for a computer mm -hmm. and I write that scene down just as fast as I can. And then, you know, later I go back and I, I, I massage it and edit it and, and hopefully improve it. But <laughs> Mostly I write the scenes in a great rush once I know what I want them to be. So at the, um, the, in the, the last portion of the book when they win the Olympics, I'm not giving anything away here, and I knew it was going to happen, but I had this great sense of tension about whether they were going to do it. And you've got all the hardships that are going on in the boat and everything else, and I actually wept at the end of it. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's my admission. <laughs> and then I read it to my wife. And I wept again. I already knew what was going to happen. So uh, you've done some, and it didn't feel cinematic or contrived, but you obviously did some crafting for that. Yeah, actually, you know, I get this tears comment a lot, <laughs> and I get it mostly from men, and I'm, uh, that's just really interesting to me. People that say they've that's just... That's funny. She turned to me and she said, why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> There's something about this story that really gets to men, which is really interesting. I mean, women enjoy it too, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, crafting that gold medal race at the end was something I anticipated through the whole writing of the book. I knew that in the Seattle area especially, there would be a certain number of people it, that, know that, that knew that the outcome was the guys win that gold medal. And it's not a secret. I don't... I don't you reveal it on the cover. You read it yeah. on the cover, exactly. <laughs> they win the gold medal. So I knew a lot of people would, would know that when they picked the book up and would know that when they started reading that race sequence. One of the realizations I had, though, is that although we know how that race ends, or we know that they win it at least, you got to remember when they climbed in that boat, they didn't know how that race was going to end. 
And so to the extent that I'm able to put the reader in the frame of mind and the point of view of each of those nine young men as they get into that boat in Germany, facing you know, the crowd chanting Deutschland, Deutschland, and all that, um, the extent to which I can make you feel what they're feeling and see what they're seeing, more you forget more. about the fact that you don't know, yeah, that you do know how it ends. You, f you, you experience it as they experience it, mm -hmm. that which is not knowing how this is going to end. Yeah, so. yeah, well, well done. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it's hard. I mean, you, you do have to really um, work at it. I also discovered, and I worried a lot about the fact that uh, these guys actually won every race they rode, and ordinarily good stories have big setbacks and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I worried about sheer repetition of having, you know, five or six rowing races. They all start sounding alike. I discovered that when you look really closely, and this comes down to research again, but when you look really closely at each of these races, they each had their own rhythm, they each had their own drama, the circumstances were different, the crowds were different, mm -hmm. the weather was different. So each one had its own kind of rhythm and personality, and so that helped a lot too. I've seen uh, a fair number of um, rowing competitions, and the, the book is titled Boys in the Boat, but it might as well be called Putting You in the Boat, because <laughs> you, you really got not only into their heads, but finally I had uh, uh, such a deeper appreciation for the, the stroke and the alchemy and the, the roles of the different people in there. How, how long did it take you to it, it get just, that down? It took, me a, you? <laughs> it took me a long time because I went into this not knowing anything about rowing at all. And that was one of my big concerns. The day after I met Joe, and uh, as I say, I was studying this Laura Hillenbrand book, but in the back of my mind was this big concern. You know, I don't know rowing. It's a complicated sport. I know nothing about it. Um, so it basically just involved a lot of work again. But I was blessed by the fact that when, particularly when the people down at the Shell House at the University of Washington found out what I was doing, they've been sitting on this story for 75 years too. Mm -hmm. And it very much redounds to the glory of Washington rowing. So when they found out what I was doing, they were very eager to help me. And, and they introduced me to rowers and took me out in the, the, the launch with the guys and gave me access to a lot of rowers. And then I through the process of uh, meeting other people, I came to know some very fine Olympic level rowers. So over the course of a couple of years, I just learned a great deal about sport. And I had rowers read every page I wrote with a very careful eye. And they did catch me, you know, in technical mistakes. But I wanted the book to be as technically accurate as I could as far as the rowing stuff went. Just as importantly, I wanted to get the experience of rowing, and so I talked to rowers a lot about what it was like to row on a particularly windy day, or what it was like to row at night on Lake Union, or what it was like to row in a really high stakes race. Because mm -hmm. I wanted not just the rowing technical stuff, but the experiential part of it to be yeah. uh, accurate. And you have the, uh, the movie from uh, at that time to be able to see yeah. a little bit of, it wasn't that the exact actual um, yeah. occasion, but it was very close. Yeah, well that some of the footage, the Lenny Riefenstahl <coughs> footage is actually footage of the gold medal race. She intercut that footage with shots that she staged the next day of close-ups in the boat. But there is also just raw film of the gold medal race, and so that was very helpful. I was able mm -hmm. to literally, literally see it. Right. So the this story got lost to history, and they were sitting on this for a very long time for a couple of reasons. One is because of the Jesse Owens story that yeah. was such a powerful story. Every Olympic has great stories, and this was obviously the dominant one. Uh, but then also Royal Brahms article, that great final article, got buried. Yeah, exactly. That you know the Jesse Owens story was so huge. Um, and it's a great story. It's a great American story, and it's rightly the first thing that comes to mind when you think about this Olympics. But it did, it dominated the coverage coming out of Berlin that summer and just blew a lot of other stories off the page. Mm -hmm. And then yet Royal Brom wrote a, a, a long, detailed article. He was there in Germany. He, he documented the race. He wrote a very detailed article about it. Tried to wire it back to Seattle for publication in the Post-Intelligencer and discovered that there was a writer's strike going on and there was no newspaper that week uh, in, in Seattle. So that story never saw print. And so, you know, both those contributed to the sort of the loss of the story. And then there was a third thing actually, which is that 
these guys didn't arrive back home to a big triumphant ticker tape parade in Seattle. They came back in dribs and drabs, and mm. so, and they immediately went out and started looking for jobs. So, they were just getting back to their lives. So, for all those reasons, the story sort of faded away. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of big promotions or Wheaties boxes. No. Although, actually, you know what? Uh, they were offered that uh, whoever makes Wheaties. General Mills, I think, wanted to put them on the cover of a Wheaties box, and they declined. They didn't want, they wanted to remain amateurs. <laughs> good for them. Yeah. I'm sure there must have been some good reasons for it. Uh, integrity or maintaining I think it was a matter status. of integrity. They really, they were, uh, they were very intent on, re on, uh, on not being commercialized in any way. Mm -hmm. The, um, I imagine with the, in the course of the story, and one of the advantages of being able to talk to you is what in the course of your research and crafting the story ended up on the cutting room floor that you wish you had made? Well, as a writer, I tend to get obsessed about whatever I'm writing about, and so I often write too much. And I got obsessed, for instance, with the whole Nazi propaganda effort, and mm -hmm. particularly the role that Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, uh, played in developing the Nazi propaganda around the Olympic events. And I wrote probably 40 pages more than I needed to about that one topic. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back and looked at the manuscript, I cut a good deal of that. And then I have a very good editor, and when she looked at it, she cut still more of it. Mm -hmm. So she sort of uh, kept me in line there. Um, so there w were a number of things like that, things I got obsessed about, got personally interested in. Mm -hmm. There's a natural inclination if you're interested in something to want to write it down. Mm -hmm. And so between my own sort of self-editing instincts and then the job that my editor does, eventually you find the line, the what, what actually contributes to advancing the story and, mm -hmm. and what doesn't. That cutting between to Nazi Germany, between the, um, what was going on with the crew at the time, those were powerful cuts. And I know a fair amount about Nazi Germany and World War II, but these were this was brand new information, and again, you personalized a lot of those stories. Yeah, well, I really wanted, the reason <coughs> I wanted to develop the strand of what was happening in Germany uh, simultaneous to what was happening in, in Seattle with these boys is, at the end of the book, it comes down to a boat race, and on one level, it's just a boat race, okay? Is it that big a deal? But I wanted readers to understand what was it, you know, what was at play symbolically in that German boat and that American boat. I wanted to remind people that on a symbolic level, there were two completely different views of the world at stake in that gold medal race. And the only way I could do that was to take the reader back into Germany, show them what was slowly unfolding behind the scenes with the Nazis, so that when they got to that final race scene, they had that, that feeling associated with the German boat. Mm -hmm. So to revisit Bobby Mock, uh, the, another one of the powerful characters in here, the, uh, there was the, the dramatic irony of his Jewish heritage and being the head of that boat. Yeah, the Bobby Mock story was really interesting in many ways, but there came this moment just before they were going to Berlin, or the weeks leading up before the trip to Berlin. Bob Mock uh, knew he had relatives in Germany and Switzerland and he wanted to visit them while he was uh, over there for the game. So he wrote home and he asked his father for the address of his relatives. And a week or so later, he gets an envelope. And inside that envelope is another envelope. And it says, open this in a private place. So Bob went out in a field and sat under a tree. And he opened the inner envelope. And he learned for the first time that he was Jewish. His entire family heritage was Jewish. and. Um, Marilyn Mock, his, his daughter, when she told me this, said that when he, when he opened that letter and he read that, he burst into tears. Not because he was upset at discovering that he was Jewish, but he was horrified that his father had felt it necessary to conceal that from him his whole life. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we forget how much anti-Semitism there was in this country right. in the 20s and 30s and 40s and beyond. Um, and so, um, so Bob Mock, you know, Bob went to Germany knowing this about himself. We don't really know much more than that about how that panned out. We, after the games, they took a bicycle tour 
a bunch of them, and Bob was one of the ones that went on the bicycle tour. Bob peeled off from that tour for a few days and, and went and visited his relatives oh. uh, and then rejoined the tour. But he never really said any more about it, so, hmm. so we just don't know any more than what happened to those relatives or what the end of that story was. Oh, that's a shame. That was an yeah. intriguing part of it that would we'll yeah. follow up on. Yeah. Right. So oftentimes with uh, people in sports, you there's a there's, especially if you get an, a peak achievement at an early age, it kind of defines you and oh no, it's all downhill from here. But these boys seem really grounded and they were they were very grounded. As for the most part, they um, some of them came home and put their gold medals in sock drawers and didn't even mention it to their family members for a long time. Many of them worked at Boeing later in life, and people that worked with them are all the time telling me they never knew that this or that of these fellows had even won a gold medal. Mm -hmm. so they were very grounded, very humble uh, uh, about it. Uh, the exception to that was Bobby Mock. Bob, uh, being very vocal, uh, spent <laughs> much of the rest of his life trying to promote the accomplishments of that crew and trying to get them into the Hall of Fame, the Rowing Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and, and trying to get more recognition recognition for for what they had done. Um, Were they introduced into the Hall of Fame? I'm, they, there are a couple of different rowing halls of fame and as far as I know neither of them, neither organization has embraced them at this point. Oh, well let's hope this has some help in that regard. Yeah. Uh, what are some other uh, favorite characters of yours? Um, pick them out because you get to like them all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really do. I, you know, I, I have to say I developed particular fondness for Bob Mock um, mm -hmm. because he's such a character. And Joe Rance, of course, because I know his story more than any of the others and because his personal circumstances were so poignant and moving. Um, you know, beyond that, I really he I, I hesitate to pick favorites because yeah. the whole point of the book really is... <clears throat> They all had interesting uh, personalities, all had interesting backstories, but it's mm -hmm. really about what they all became together and, and what they were, not as individuals, but mm -hmm. as a whole. Joe's wife, Joyce's story was very intriguing to me. Yeah, you know, Joyce, um, Joyce, you really have to give credit to Joyce. For, Joyce was a farm girl raised out in Squim, but she chose to go to university and UW and she excelled there. She actually graduated Phi Beta Kappa from, uh, from U UW at a time when not many women were even going to the university. So she was a very accomplished young woman, but she was also the one person in Joe's life that really got him. You know, She was there from an early age. She saw all this stuff that Joe went through with his stepmother and the travails that he went through just trying to stay alive and feed himself. Mm -hmm. And so, from the earliest days that they were together, she understood Joe and what he was experiencing, and she was really the rock for him that got him through, I think, some of the hardest times he had. Some of her individual stories, like her, uh, her occupations, I'm glad those didn't end up on the cutting room floor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those were, those were good. Uh, what has this story come to mean to you over time, personally? You know, there's a lot of layers to this story for me. There's a lot of different sort of messages to take from it, but there actually is one in particular that, and I didn't realize this until I was done with the book. I did not write the book with this in mind. But when I stand back from this story and I, I look at these nine young Americans who climbed in a boat and learned to pull together so powerfully and so beautifully, for me, it's an almost perfect metaphor for what that whole generation of Americans did. Yeah, I'm talking about the generation that Tom Brokaw called the greatest, greatest generation. generation. Yeah. The, you know, the generation of my parents and my aunts and my uncles. They found themselves in the same boat beginning in the fall of 1929 with the crash and the depression. They all experienced a great deal of privation. They found themselves in the same boat. They learned to pull together they learned to get great things done together, you know, build these great public monuments like the Grand Coulee Dam, win World War II on not one but two fronts, mm -hmm. build the most prosperous era in our history after the war. So I'm a big admirer of them, and as I say, I think this story of these nine of them that happened to be in that boat is a pretty good metaphor for what the whole generation was all about, yeah. pulling together. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Daniel, this has been a wonderful conversation, and uh, thank you so much for sharing this and giving some behind-the-scenes uh, information for the, the students here and for sharing your time. Oh, I had a great time. Yeah. Th thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. <laughs> yards. Great Britain leading on the far side. Italy coming up. Germany nearest to us third. Hungary fourth. But there's America, way over there. in front to win by a yard. Italy second, Germany third.